Welcome back. So in this lecture, I'm going to show you how to compress images using the FFT2 command in MATLAB. And this is one of my favorite lectures because uh, you get a lot of intuition for how the Fourier transform works because we, we have such deep intuition about images. Uh, when you use the FFT for compressing images, I think this is a really nice example uh, to kind of see how everything works. Okay, so we're going to walk through this uh, this example. I'm actually going to walk through three different image uh, image examples here. I'm going to start with the Afghan girl, the famous National Geographic uh, cover picture. Uh, it's easy to read images in MATLAB using the im read command. Uh, we can convert this color image to grayscale using RGB to gray, because I only want to work with a grayscale uh, matrix for illustration purposes. Uh, before I, I do that, I'm going to plot this image for you in full color. Uh, and notice that I have 256 minus A, where A is my, uh, my matrix, my image. I'm doing this 256 minus A because I've inverted my color scheme for this black background. Uh, you would just do image SC of A. Okay, so let's run this code. Okay, so this is the famous National Geographic cover uh, of the Afghan girl. Uh, it's a pretty high resolution image. If I want, um, I can do size of A. And we see that it's almost square uh, 1400 by 1400 pixels with three color channels. And if I do the same thing with B, if I just type size of B, it's the same 1400 by 1400 pixels, but now we've collapsed those three color channels into a grayscale channel, okay? So that was the, the original image. Now we're gonna compute the FFT, uh, and this is super simple using the FFT2 command in MATLAB. Uh, and so if B was my grayscale image, BT is B transformed or B in the Fourier domain. Uh, and I'm going to plot for you these Fourier coefficients, but they're so tiny, so many of them are so small, I'm going to have to um, compute them on a log scale. So there's a lot of stuff going on here. Um, FFT shift, MATLAB, remember, uh, MATLAB orders the Fourier coefficients in a bit of a funny way. So FFT shift will reorder them so that the lowest frequency modes are at the origin and the highest frequency modes are at the corners. So that's what FFT shift does. Uh, and then I'm taking the absolute value because these are complex numbers, and I'm taking the logarithm to plot them on a log scale. And because some of them might be um, nearly uh, nearly zero, I'm adding one to offset uh, my, my logarithmic scale, okay? Uh, so that's F, um, this shouldn't be F low, this should just be F, uh, let's call this F B log. Okay, a blog, and we're going to plot that for you. And again, I'm doing 256 minus because I have an inverted color scheme. Okay, this is what the Fourier coefficients look like. Remember, this is on the log scale. So most of these gray regions should actually be completely black, like almost zero value. Uh, we plotted them on a log scale to make everything pop out a little bit more. What you see here is um, kind of in the origin, this is where the lowest frequency components are. It's the brightest, kind of the highest magnitude values uh, in the origin. And then they kind of decay and get smaller and smaller and smaller as you go to higher and higher and higher frequencies, which is kind of consistent with our intuition that um, lower frequency uh, uh, lower frequency modes have more energy in, in images. That, that's generally true, okay? Um, now, it's interesting, you can see kind of these, these starburst patterns, or at least I can see it, um, and you definitely have a very strong kind of vertical and horizontal axis, these kind of white lines uh, at the X and Y axes. And I want you to be thinking in the back of your head why, um, why you would have those kind of vertical lines in this Fourier transform, and, and I'll, I'll kind of tell you later uh, if I remember. Okay, but this is the basic idea. Remember, this is on a log plot, so most of these values, unless they're ultra, ultra bright, they're very small. So we're gonna only keep the largest magnitude um, Fourier coefficients, and, and we're gonna use those for the, for the inverse Fourier transform, okay? So the main point here is that we're just computing the FFT2 using this single line in MATLAB. That's, that's really the, the story, is that it's easy to compute this Fourier transform. I, everything else was just plotting. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this Fourier transform for compression. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to uh, manually pull out just the largest uh, 99 
percent of the Fourier coefficients, the largest 5% coefficients, the largest 1%, and the largest 0.2% of the coefficients. So we're going to keep basically 99% of them, 5% of them, 1%, and 0.2% of the largest coefficients manually. And then after we zero out everything else, we're going to inverse Fourier transform and see how good our image looks, how we're going to compress a lot, and we're going to see how much degradation there is in our image. And the way I do this, um, this is actually like a homework I give for my students uh, at, at the University of Washington. What we're going to do is we're going to sort our Fourier coefficients from line 11. So these are my, my Fourier transform coefficients. We're basically going to turn that array of Fourier coefficients into a really, really big vector using this BT of colon that vectorizes it. Then we sort them from biggest to smallest. Okay, so that's BT sort. And then what we're going to do is we're basically going to pick a threshold. So we're going to pick like the top, you know, 1%, the top 5%, the top 99%. And we're going to use that threshold uh, to determine which of those coefficients are larger in the largest 5% and which ones are in the, you know, the 95% that are going to get truncated. Okay, so that's how you pick your threshold. So that's, that's where you draw the line in terms of Fourier magnitude. This line here, indices equals um, the magnitude of BT greater than threshold. What that does is it creates an array the same size as my original Fourier transform matrix of zeros and ones. It will be zero everywhere where the Fourier magnitude is smaller than threshold, and it'll be one everywhere that it's larger than threshold. And so in that way, this indice matrix is basically a mask. If I take my Fourier transform matrix and I multiply it with this indices matrix, it will zero out all of the small coefficients that are below threshold, and it'll keep all of the big coefficients that are above threshold. Okay, and then all I'm going to do uh, is basically inverse fast Fourier transform uh, and then show you the image. Okay, so let's do that right now. Okay, excellent. And so here we have, um, I've shown kind of 99, if you keep 99% of these Fourier coefficients, so basically no compression at all, you can think of this as the full high resolution image. And then we have our 5% uh, where we only kept 5% of the coefficients, we only kept 1% of the coefficients, and we only kept 0.2% of the coefficients. So this is a compression ratio of 20. We compressed by a factor of 20. Here we compressed by a factor of 100, and here we compressed by a factor of 500. So massive compression. We're only keeping a very small amount of the Fourier coefficients. And I want to walk you through kind of how these different um, compressions look. So right off the bat, you actually see that the 5% and the 1% image compression look really, really good. You can see most of the features in this image are retained. There's relatively little uh, kind of lack of uh, degradation of image quality here. In the 500 times compression, you can see that now the image looks really grainy. This looks like a, kind of an old photograph that, that's really grainy. And there's a lot of features missing here. So, so 0.2% was over compression. We, we were too aggressive. We zeroed out too many important Fourier coefficients. But the 1% and the 5% are actually looking pretty good. Now I'm going to zoom into the eyes just so you can see that there is actually some image degradation happening even in the 1% the case. So I'm going to try to just zoom into all of the eyes here. And what you're going to see is that In the full resolution image and in the 5% compression, they're actually pretty close. Okay, so there are some details in the full image uh, in the kind of iris and the glint that aren't perfectly captured in the 5% or in the 20 times compression, but I'd say this is pretty good. When you get to the 100 times compression ratio, now you can see, uh, now that we're zoomed in, there's still a lot of details that are missing here. So you can't really see eyelashes. You can't really see um, resolution of the, of the cornea and iris. And by the time you get over here, it's almost completely obliterated, that fine, fine structure. Okay, so that's, uh, okay, so that's our first example, just to show you, first of all, that when you Fourier transform, most of the coefficients are small, and you can get away with throwing away, you know, at least 95% of those coefficients without serious degradation to the image quality. Okay, good. Um, back to my original question, why are there, um, let me go back up here, why are there so many, um, 
why are is the Fourier transform uh, so bright in the vertical and horizontal axes here, corresponding to kind of zero frequency in Y and zero frequency in X? And the answer, uh, hopefully some of you were, were following this, the answer is that, remember the Fourier transform only works for perfectly periodic signals. Okay, so it has to be periodic in X and periodic in Y, because we're decomposing this in sines and cosines. This image is not perfectly periodic. Um, and in fact, it's more periodic in X, because the green boundaries are closer to being the same in X. But it's, it's actually not very periodic in Y. Notice the entire top boundary is green, and most of the bottom boundary is red. Okay, so this is not actually periodic. There's a jump discontinuity in the pixel values at the top and the bottom and the left and the right. And so that manifests itself uh, as this big vertical bright lines uh, in the horizontal direction. So you'll see that when you Fourier transform images, generally speaking, uh, is, are those kind of lines. Okay, good. Let's try another example. I'm gonna do this uh, dog cat example here. So this is an adorable uh, picture of a dog and a cat kind of nuzzling. Uh, and we're going to see how this is a smaller image. You can already tell that this is a much smaller image. Um, in fact, let's just see how size of A, it's only 437 by 660 pixels. So I'm going to Fourier transform. Similarly, we get this uh, Fourier transform. And now we're going to do the same compression. Okay, good. So what do you notice uh, in this image? So again, 99% uh, to 5%, there's relatively little degradation, like 5% is definitely better than 1% or 0.2%. But what I would point out here is that in all of these compressions, the compressed image looks worse than it did for the Afghan girl. Okay, so all of these compressions at 5%, at 1%, at 0.2% are worse than the compression for the higher resolution Afghan girl image. And, and one of the reasons is the bigger the image is to begin with, the higher the resolution your starting image, generally speaking, the more you can compress it. The smaller the image, the more you need those Fourier coefficients to represent the things in that image. So high resolution images are more compressible than low res images. But the other thing I think is really interesting here, this entire image has a lot of texture. It's got a lot of grass and fur. And grass and fur are notoriously difficult uh, to compress using the Fourier transform because they're very high frequency. If you think about this grass, that's very, very high frequency in space, and the fur is even higher frequency in space. So hair is really hard to compress and to model in the Fourier domain. So you also get less compression just because the thing you're trying to compress has more high frequency content. There's more stuff out here that matters. Okay, and actually this was um, a big deal for Pixar. So if you look at the history of Pixar movies, their first movie, Toy Story, no one had hair. They were all plastic dolls because it was much, much easier to render plastic, uh, smooth plastic surfaces than hair and texture and fur. Okay, so um, there's actually this progression of Pixar movies when they went from being able to model smooth plastic to furry monsters. And that was a big deal because this is a lot harder to compress and to represent. Okay, good. Uh, in the last example, I'll show just my dog Mordecai, which is a very high resolution image. So I'm gonna do the whole thing again. So that's Mort, that's his FFT. Uh, and this is the compression. And again, because this is a very high resolution image, uh, you can get away with compressing more, even though there is some texture and some fur, and you know he has modeled uh, a modeled backside. Uh, but you can still compress more pretty effectively um, because it's just a very high resolution image. Okay, good. Um, okay, excellent. So that's kind of what I wanted to show you about um, about image compression, how you use the fast Fourier transform uh, to compress these images. Uh, in some future lecture, I would like to show you that you can actually plot these images as surfaces. So I think that would be uh, kind of a cool thing to show you. Um, in fact, let me just see if I can uh, if I can do this right now. A low uh, ten to ten to end ten to ten to end. Oof, that's always a little dangerous to do this live coding. 
Um, okay, so this is that low pass, th this is the FFT compressed version of the Afghan girl. And I've only picked every 10th pixel because it would be far too high dimensional to plot the surface. Um, this, is, this is every pixel intensity plotted as a height. So higher intensity pixels are higher on the surface plot. I actually made this visualization because I was showing this to my mom and I was trying to explain kind of how the Fourier transform worked for image compression and I realized that this would be the best way to show her is to plot everything as a pixel intensity. And what you see here, that is the Afghan girl, okay? And this is her face, kind of the intense pixels, the, so the, the whites of her eye are maybe the brightest uh, pixels. Those are the peaks of the mountain. And everything that's bright is higher than everything that's dark. So the cowl, kind of her shadow in the cowl uh, is, is lower valleys, and the brights of her eyes are higher. Uh, this is a little, the colors are inverted here, um, so it's a little bit backwards. But this gives you an idea of what we're doing in image compression. So what we're trying to do is approximate this surface, this is literally a surface of pixel intensities, by a sum of spatial wave numbers. So remember those, those four people standing on equal sides of this bed sheet. You hold it tight, and then the first two people pump in the x direction at some spatial frequency. The other two people in the y direction pump at a different frequency. And you create this kind of sinusoidal bed sheet and if you add enough of those up, you can make this kind of mountainous uh, landscape here. That's what we're doing. Each of these Fourier coefficients is kind of like that bed sheet at a different frequency. And you're going to add those up in a perfect proportion to reconstruct the pixel intensity uh, of this face. Okay? So I just love this visualization. It's super cool. You can see kind of the, the intensity and in what we're trying to approximate with this Fourier transform. Okay? Okay, good. So this is how you compress images with the Fourier transform. In later lectures, I'll show you how to do this using an even better uh, compression, using the wavelet transform. So it's built on the FFT, uh, but it's a better basis uh, to compress images in. Okay, thank you.